It's Wednesday, September 23rd, 2020, and welcome back to the McSpencer Group. We are still polling quite poorly in Wisconsin. Joining me are Ed Dutton and Keith Woods. Main topic, the death of atheism. It seemed like only yesterday that all those online atheists were dominating YouTube, owning the fundies with facts and logic. The dinosaurs are real, take that, Christians. Chief atheist Richard Dawkins just released a new book, Outgrowing God. If anything, it expresses the intellectual exhaustion and growing irrelevancy of the movement he launched some 15 years ago. Ed, Keith, and I look back at so-called new atheism, revealing how those liberal edgelords never ask any serious questions and how the battle between science and religion is not what it's cracked up to be. Welcome back to the McSpencer Group. Um, the team has reassembled. I'm very happy about that. Um, Keith, how are you doing? You're back from your um, summer abroad, uh, full of wandering, womanizing, and wine drinking, I presume, or at least I hope. Keith, um, how many how, how many STDs did you contract during your summer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure, but... Uh... My head feels a lot clearer, you know. I've had no Anglo takes contaminating my thinking for the last oh. couple of months. So. <laughs> Feeling clear-headed can also be a symptom of pubic lice. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what it is. Um, I went to a uh, pumpkin fair yesterday with the kiddos, so uh, that was a lot of fun. You know, swinging around, riding around on hay rides for hours. Uh, great stuff. It actually was pretty fun. Um, eating caramel popcorn, yum. Uh, Ed, how are you doing? I'm I'm okay. Yeah, I I, I haven't spent the summer contracting sexually transmitted diseases from Southern European tarts. Uh, mm. I've uh, uh, I I've been doing wholesome things. Um, uh, for example, yesterday I went with my family to a spa hotel in Rockwa, which is in uh, about an hour from here. Uh, that, was, mm. that, that was that was that was very pleasant, and I uh, went on a, a long forest walk. So that cool. Was, that was, that was you get that. in one of the Scandinavian saunas. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, they have those. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. at, the, at, the, at, the, at the spa hotel. Yes. yes. So uh, there was a, a steam one and a Finnish one. So yeah, I've been mm. I've been doing that. But, so I haven't been having the kind of time that that, uh, that Keith has been having. <laughs> well, no one has. I mean, outside that of Don Juan of, himself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in Italia, il al mille tre. Um, how many did a uh, Keith have in Greece, we, we might never know. The real, the real uh, question is from, from Ed's perspective, is that race makes an air to Southern Europeans white? Uh, significantly white, yeah. Uh, it depends whether we're, we're, we're dealing with Portuguese people here. There's quite a lot of uh, black admixture in the native Portuguese population. But Actually, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, with Varg Post and, you know, Varg Vikernes, but uh, I actually saw him recently on Twitter. He was arguing with an Anglo, and he was uh, he was disparaging the Anglo on the basis that uh, he thinks Queen Victoria was a gypsy. Which is <laughs> never heard that one. Take. <laughs> uh, he, he he's kind of I I, I kind of like Varg, but I like him from a distance. Like I, I kind of like that there's this madman out there, kind of you know, <laughs> like <laughs> ranting and raving, but I, you kind of want to keep your distance from mad men. Well, I would basically. say about that is that Queen Victoria was a carrier of hemophilia, and there okay. was no record of hemophilia in the royal family before her. So either uh, her father was hmm. about 50 when she was born, uh, early 50s, so either it was a genetic mutation on her father's sperm, or her mother copped it off with a gypsy hemophilia. <laughs> So it's, it's 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 one or the other. Interesting. And they're equally possible. Equally possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's talk about new atheism. So, it, I I asked you guys to do this just because Richard Dawkins has a new book out, and so I thought this would be at least somewhat timely. I'm not sure the size of the splash that this latest volume is making it's called uh outgrowing god or growing it's up children. from god or it's mm. children it, it i've i've actually um listened to about three hours of it now just kind of as i was doing chores or 
whatever. And it, yeah, it's kind of, I, I, it's, it's like the God delusion for dummies. It's, it's kind of, he's mm. not saying anything that he hasn't said before and it is kind of dumbed down a bit. Um, so yes, he's trying to get the teenage set or something. Um, but, uh, this book has not made a huge splash. It'll, you know, sell a lot of copies, I'm sure. But um, he did make a big splash uh, when he published The God Delusion in 2006. And there was this phenomenon that lasted about 10 years. And it was, to a very large degree, a YouTube phenomenon, which is also interesting because it was at the time of the growth of YouTube. And it was the the atheism, new atheism, as they called it. It was not new. And it most all of what they were saying was not new at all. Uh, but it it was something that was actually quite powerful and um, influential. Um, I think it might have, you. It's. I don't think it's too much to say that it changed minds on a mass scale and at least contributed to the decline of religious belief, particularly Christian belief um, in America and, and the Western world. So it was a thing. Um, but I, I think it's something that is is now kind of old now. It's now feeling a bit outmoded. And I think it's something that we can kind of look back on and examine a bit. And uh, I guess it's interesting that we have this panel assembled because I, I think each of us in our own way is kind of a eccentric about religion. Um, I don't think I've, I don't think any of us really uh, want to adopt an atheist label, although I, I don't think we also have the same perspective as an average churchgoer as well. Um, but anyway, they, I'm just kind of setting the table here. Uh, but um, Keith, you're younger than I am. When, when new atheism came around, I was already kind of like on a few meta levels up. But you were a teenager or even younger. I can't remember when I met your mom, but... Um, you were um, fairly young when new atheism was was you know bounding onto the scene. Um, was was this influential as a kind of young precocious know it all, uh, <laughs> or was um, it not influential at all? I'm curious. Not not really at the time, but I remember when I don't think I got like regular uh, internet access. So I was like 16, 17, and then. It was actually like when when I you know started using YouTube or whatever. That was actually one of the first things I gravitated towards was uh, the new atheism stuff. Because I, I don't know, there's a certain kind of person I think on the the internet that's just kind of attack attracted to uh, drama and conflict and arguments. But uh, it, it is kind of funny to look at the the progress that some of those uh, internet atheist types made. It kind of I think it, it in a funny way it kind of mirrors a lot of the people that sort of came into the alt right and that like. <laughs> You know, you, you look at true. the you look at the channels of some of them. Um, like, what's that guy TJ something? The amazing atheist or whatever. But it's like it well, he's off. kind of almost alt right now or something. Yeah, it's funny this progress. He's, he's, he's kind like, of funny. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm not trying to ca uh, you know uh, slander him or anything, but he he's definitely kind of edgy in a in a real way, not just like making fun of Christians, which is not particularly um, uh, edgy at this point, but. Um, but then there are other ones. Like I remember when I would watch these. Because... Well, atheism is unstoppable. Got banned a couple of months ago. Right. Because he had, you know, he started talking to like Jared Taylor. Because it's like it's funny the route they went. It was like they started off like arguing with theists, and then they moved on to like veganism, and then it was like SJWs, and then mm -hmm. the next thing it was like a little bit of race realism, and then oh god, you know, all of a sudden they're like in the alt right <laughs> side of things. Well, it, it is true in the sense of, I mean, a, a, a lot of them are genuinely open-minded. I will, I, I'm maybe autistic. I'm willing to go there and so on. And then they actually do go there. I think Atheism Unstoppable is is a lot like that. I mean, I've, I've watched a number of his videos. He does seem to be ultimately a kind of classical liberal, but he is willing to go there on a, on a lot of different subjects. And um, and then you had the other ones. I remember um, Jackie Glenn, I believe is her name. And she was kind of like the uh, cute, young, I'm not like the other girls, uh, amazing atheist. And uh, I, I remember seeing some of her videos, you know, I, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And then I caught one last year or something. And she's like talking to transsexuals and full on, you know, SJW hating her parents and whatever. So there are many different paths that they can take. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I would say this. I mean, one of the reasons why I don't 
have a, a tremendous amount of respect for new atheism is that it's coming at lo- a century or two centuries after a major crisis of faith that was occurring uh, to a degree due to enlightenment thinkers who were kind of operating on, a, on an elite level. Um, it was it's coming after Darwin. It's coming after Nietzsche. It's coming after the world, the First World War, which you know itself just brought about a, a kind of you know end of tradition and everything you take for granted. Um, and they're doing it now, and it just it, it's all it you know even if I might agree with many things that they say, uh, there, there's a level at which they're just kind of tedious last men. Um, uh, kind of it's arguing not, for things that have that, already been kind of that, won they've, they've, they've absolutely nothing to lose. So right, and, and, that's true. And, and everything to gain. So it's a way of signaling how rational and logical they are and how intelligent they are and how, thought, how thoughtful they are. They have that to gain. But there's essentially, apart from pissing off a few nutcases, a, a few extremist fundamentalists, there really is nothing to lose. There's nothing to lose. It's weak. It's a weak thing to do. So whereas, whereas when people were doing something like that um, a couple of hundred years ago, someone like Darwin, he, he seriously didn't want to come up. He, he, he came up with the idea of evolution and then he held right. back on it for late, about 20 years because he knew what offense it would cause and how, how, how socially problematic it would be and how much it would upset his wife, who was a highly committed Christian. <laughs> and, 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 right. and, and then he wouldn't get sex, I suppose, and 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 things and things and things and things like this. And he held, and when he was under the impression, some people say wrongly, that uh, somebody else was about to go there with the same idea. Then he mm-hmm. then he went ahead and published. And these people had something to lose; they could be socially ostracised. I mean, if, if you go right. back to hundred years before that, there was no worse insult that could be thrown at people than than being an atheist. To be an atheist, if you were found guilty of atheism, they'd burn you. Um, and uh, so, and, and it was a. Uh, Although it seems that there were atheists around, nobody kind of knew their names or whatever, because this would be done kind of secretly and in secret societies, and you'd all be very careful and whatever. And so there really is, there's, there's, they're not brave. It's like, it's like if you if you live in Eastern Europe, parts of Eastern Europe now, and you're woke and you're pro leftist. Well, I don't necessarily agree with you. Uh, I don't agree with you. I don't think what you're doing is good for the society. But I have a right. certain amount of respect for the activists that, that are pro LGBT in like Russia or whatever because they're, they're losing their jobs and, 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 and having serious problems. Um, you've got nothing to lose doing this in the in in Britain or or, or somewhere like that. And so it's yeah. kind of like that. I have very little. Uh, it's a, it's a sort of a feeble thing to do. I suppose with, with the God delusion. Sorry. Yeah, let me add real quick, although I think you might be going there, um, just to give a slight bit of credit to Richard Dawkins. Um, in 2006, this it was a bit of a different time, you understand. Well, well, this, this, this was the height. The White House. You have a fundamental yeah. in the White House. Or um, so he said, and this was the height of the religious right, and we're gonna. They, they were they were openly in some cases, a you know, minority view, but we're talking about we're gonna install a theocracy, and God is on George W. Bush's side, and we're going to invade the entire planet and install Christian democracy. So I mean, he he at least took on something. That is that. true. I was about to go. I was about to say that. That is true. Yeah. That, in the context of 2006, we just had the Iraq War, or it was ongoing the Iraq War, um, mm-hmm. and it suggested that this was you know, he and Blair prayed together or whatever. But mm-hmm. Blair, Blair was this extremely committed to Roman Catholic. Uh, Bush was this uh, born again Christian who'd been an alcoholic or whatever it was and had some kind of mm-hmm. converting experience. So it is true that religiousness was much more powerful then, and therefore there was the degree to which you work. There was a sort of religious establishment to some extent, or the, the woke mm-hmm. establishment wasn't as dominant uh, as it is no. now. And so, and so, so, so now I think the reason why this atheistic tracts are, are so much less interesting is because. It, religion is now marginalized. Religion is now disempowered. Uh, yeah. It's it's the woke people who are all kind of atheists or whatever anyway, who are in charge and who have power. And so you're not really, you know, it, it's rather feeble to, to, to waste your energy on it when there are kind of bigger fish to fry. Also, more importantly, we are now, the society, the irreligious society is bearing fruit. And we are seeing the results of a generation who have been raised not with a group selected ideology, i.e. religiousness, uh, which pushes them in a group selected 
pro-social direction where you sacrifice the interests of the self for the interests of the group and whatever, but right. an individualistic ideology, which is all about the feelings of the individual and everyone not feeling upset and feeling they're all equal and feeling the same. And we're seeing this bear fruit in this emotionally incontinent snowflake generation um, who are utterly lack of, who are utterly bigoted in their thinking and can't take criticism and can't deal with people that think differently from them. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, it's no longer in any way brave to challenge religion and to challenge God and whatever. It's it's, it's brave to challenge atheism and to challenge those people. Um, and, and so, and and, it, and and it becomes intellectually dangerous to toy with the idea that not only could whether God exists, I don't know, but but that there could be positive things about religion because that's what undermines really a kind of state communism, um, which is now so yeah. So I think it's just it's just the last gasp of a a man who's who spent his career obsessed with slagging off uh religion and I don't know, maybe he needs the money. I don't know. Because it, I, I think the I think the interesting question about new atheism is what you know what was new in the new atheism because oh you know obviously as you said like other people better people Very have little. made these arguments before yeah. them. Well, I, I think what was new was one how bad the arguments were, uh, <laughs> and I, I do actually think that was part of why it was a popular phenomenon. Is it was like, you know, it's kind of like the McDonald's of like uh, secular philosophy in that it just sort of stripped any of the, you know, any of the. Any of the good arguments that's in atheism as a tradition and it's just stripped, it do you know what i would say keith is that it stripped the tragedy from it all because yeah well that's where i was going with the second aspect one aspect is yeah. how, just how bad the arguments are but the second aspect was the evangelical tone that came with it and that yeah. you know, previous atheist philosophers i mean you know what like nietzsche was grappling with this as a serious problem and i think he recognized the yeah. you know the tragedy of the death of god and the huge problems i think he foresaw yeah. a lot of the problems that were earthquakes sort of and volcanoes or whatever he was writing about yeah I mean, <laughs> yeah and the whole you know and the whole project of of modernity and that's like that's just completely lacking in the new atheists i mean you know the there's a few of them are, are, are actually uh, Dennett is a philosopher. AC Grennan is a philosopher. I mean, Dawkins doesn't put forward any philosophical arguments, really. It's basically sort of moralistic tomes against the Old Testament God. Yeah. Uh, but no actual engagement with, you know, classical theism in terms of, you know, the basis for it as a philosophy. But uh, the remarkable thing is how much they just kind of presuppose this uh, like secular christian morality i mean like dennett at times will make arguments that well morality is just a uh, you know evolutionary ad adaptation darwinianism and things but then at other times uh, he'll just uh you know he'll just treat it as obvious that the these sort of uh you know this very complex christian moral worldview is just it was just always obvious to people and uh, you know as well the way they'll just kind of skirt over uh some of the horrors of the the 20th century which or, right. You know, and it uh, and it wasn't. I mean, I, I think, you know, in, in the God delusion, Dawkins does make some gestures towards I mean, he, he actually he he doesn't quite dismiss, but he uh, is skeptical of group evolution uh, in a way that Ed is not. But he, he, he does kind of say that, you know, morality um, is is going to evolve and it's going to precede religion in the sense that you have to get along and cooperate with your group. You obviously have a lot at stake with your own children and even your I, nephews and cousins. I mean, that, and so on. that is true. There were some studies which I which I found on this recently. It is it is true that that well no what what is I've just found this is a, a, a review I did of the God delusion in in uh, two thousand and seven. Mm. I just I just dug it out. Uh, but no, he, he, but one of the things that was found is that moral is, is that highly complex societies precede moral gods. So the, the order in which it goes is high level of, of societal complexity. Then moral gods seem to develop as a way of holding that society together. Um, and as for his skepticism of evil of, of group selection, I think that's just a result of I think that's his own personal problem. So in the seventies, when uh, he basically talked about group selection, the National Front, which were the main British far right party at the time, uh -huh. picked up on this and said, "Oh yeah, Richard Dawkins, this professor has <laughs> has, blah, blah, has said this, and so therefore we right. wipe." People. And and there and there he he was horrified that he should be associated with the National Front, yeah. and so he came out and condemned. My God. Group 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 selection, but the, I mean, it, it, I've got a. I've recently uh, written some, uh, written a, did, did, did a video on this for the Jolly Heretic, and I've looked. At, there is no logical argument against group selection 
at all. It is quite clear. The first argument they use is that oh, well, we were in these small bands in, in um, on the in, in the player scene or whatever, um, mm. and so consequently we couldn't have developed group selection because we were in these sparse bands. But it, it's been shown that there were appalling wars, appalling genocide in the player scene, A. B, that though they were these sparse little bands of clans that were separate, they would come together in perceived times of crisis when outsiders were trying to destroy them. They would come together, like, you know, 10 times their numbers. Um, right. And so there would be group selection. There's clear evidence of massacres of huge numbers of people. Um, there's test, there's uh, historical evidence, archaeological evidence of the wiping out of entire tribes by other tribes. Um, right. So that is group selection. Um, it's a logical extension of kin selection, and computer modeling has demonstrated that group selection seems to explain this. So he has just a prejudice against group selection. Um, and and it's uh, as for what he says about religion as well, he says that, oh, well, religion, it's this kind of misfiring of various right. useful, adaptive things. Um, well, that's clearly bollocks, because for, for something to be a adaptive for it to be accepted to be adaptive in evolution and he would know that as an evolutionist it has to be it has to be partly partly heritable or religiousness is at least 0.4 heritable aspects of religious 0.7 like fundamentalism is 0.7 heritable it has to be associated with fertility which it is heavily it has to be associated with mental health and uh, health and physical health which it is at the genetic level it has there have to be certain parts of the brain that are associated with it you stimulate them with magnets you become more religious or whatever which is the case it has to be associated with pro-social traits because we're a group oriented species which it is um so on, on every single marker of it religiousness is something that's been selected for in itself um and and he can't and, and so therefore he, he can't just dismiss it as, as some some misfiring of adaptive things like following the leader and and uh, uh, over detecting agency. That's not that's not the case. And as Keith said, yeah. is that it's how it's how bad the arguments are. Like he, he he's so dismissive of things. He's so he's 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 so emotional in the way he presents things. He's so completely over the top. In this new one, for example, rather than talk about the existence of God, he kind of poisons the well by saying, "Oh well, you know, there are people that believe in fairies, and there are people that believe in." In, and there are people that believe in you know talking talking dinosaurs or whatever um and, 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 and it, that and is it, true uh, well yeah and it just it just seems to be a complete and the the you mentioned you said that you you think he's the worst of them i don't think he um, i think he's the in some ways because someone like daniel Dennett, who you mentioned a minute ago or keith mentioned um openly said that that, that scientists should lie yeah <laughs> interesting yeah, if the social consequences are too... I think he said actually specifically about something like race and IQ. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did. He's open, he was one of these new atheists, and he openly said that. And at least Dawkins hasn't said that. And um, but my counter-argument to that is, is that uh, traditionally, scientists had these transcendental values, these values that the truth, the truth is sacrosanct and what that ultimately comes from is neo-thomism is a is a really a belief what these scientists originally believed was that um their purpose was to unveil god's revelation and therefore right. to lie that means that you can't lie you you believe in eternal truth and what backs it up as true is the a sort of traditionalist idea that there's there's a, a metaphysical realm which verifies it as true or god that verifies it as true um and then the belief in god died but the belief in truth without god the, the worship of truth hung on for a while and um i don't know if dawkins right. has that to a greater extent this is a very nietzschean argument i mean I, and he might very well have not been the only one to make it but he 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 basically made exactly the argument that you just made he 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 overturns this notion of like the the opposition the great battle between science and religion and he he demonstrates that science in a way overestimates truth and and that's a kind of very you know kind of a little bit uh, sarcastic way of that Nietzsche would put things, uh, but in the sense that truth itself is divine and you must pursue it, and so science is lit by the same lamp as religious fervor of previous years. And then there's a, a kind of historical irony to this, in the sense that this quest for truth at all cost is bringing about the end of religion, and might be very well bringing about the end of civilization in the sense that it makes us question too much, that we overestimate truth. And this is again in Nietzsche's kind of, you know, playful way and 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 in discomforting way as well. He'll kind of 
look at, you know, we shouldn't just value memory, we should also value forgetting. And we shouldn't just value truth at all costs, even at the cost of ourselves, we might actually need to value illusion and delusion at some point. I mean, this is, again, the a very kind of Nietzschean move in that sense. Uh, but you want to go ahead, Ed? I have, I have, uh, I was gonna say, have some so more to go he, on this. He gets, people argue that he's a bit like a fundamentalist because he's dogmatic, Dawkins, because he's dogmatic, yeah. he's highly uh, he's highly emotional in his argumentation. He seems very, very certain and whatever. And his counter-argument is, no, I'm not a fundamentalist, says in Do The God Delusion, because fundamentalists know they are right because they have read the truth in a holy book. Now that's what I mean about the the just the badness of these arguments. So, what what about religions that are not religions of the book, like Hinduism? Right. Um, or, or I mean, it, it, it just evidence like he doesn't care. He doesn't. He's not even trying to argue a logical case. If you say something as dismissive of that, as dismissive as that, that can be just pulled apart very very quickly. Um, right. he just, it's, it's it's just a way of of rallying the troops with a load of emotional bad arguments and saying, oh yeah, there's no God. Oh, aren't we cleverer than these stupid Christians that believe in a right. God on a cloud? And it's, uh, but, but, I mean, let's let's go look, because you know Dawkins himself acknowledges, as he did in the Do God Illusion, and as in, and as he would now, that there there morality is evolved in the sense that it actually is good to cooperate it is good for people to trust you and not lie etc and that that this operates also in a kind of group level in the sense that for those things to work and good you have to have trust and investment with the people around you. So you might very well be as gentle as a lamb with your children and nephews and friends and colleagues, and you might be as violent and ruthless and amoral as a lion when you are facing off uh, with another band that also wants that piece of territory or might want to kill you or take your territory, uh, et cetera. There, there is a kind of in-group, out-group component of morality in the sense that it evolved yeah. uh and it, you you can even you know see this in in populations like germans and japanese who are well, if you look you know, completely if you look nice and moral, even, if not goofy be, when they're within their own societies and then it tends, it tends utterly to be <laughs> a total maniacs when they're going to war with other populations yeah precisely uh, that's, yeah <laughs> that's what's been selected for that is the morality that's been selected for high and positive and negative ethnocentrism and once you right. get a group where once you get a group which is which is sufficiently large like a city or whatever where you you're not going where you're not closely genetically related to the person they're not a member of your family or your extended family uh, and where indeed you might not even ever see them again then you have to have some reason to cooperate with them um right. and and that's where moral gods then come from because the if that if he believes in the same moral god as you then it's an insurance policy that he will cooperate you know, he he will cooperate as well for the greater good of the society, and you're not you you're not, he's not going to be a free rider. He's not going to uh, pay a parasite off the society. He's mm -hmm. going to cooperate. He's going to cooperate with you back. You can trust him. It's an insurance policy. Uh, and, and and if they don't believe in the same gods as you, then that shows that well maybe you can't trust them. And so that's yeah. where religion becomes important. And that and and therefore morality it becomes a being highly moral and pro social. Uh, uh, internally cooperative and externally hostile becomes um, selected for concomitantly, but both because of religiousness, because the, the mm -hmm. group of religious is better able to be positively and negatively ethnocentric because it's the will of the gods they believe in, but also it becomes religiousness, therefore, becomes selected for concomitantly with greater morality and whatever. And what you find um, the group that is going to be more is, is going to become selected for is going to be more and more internally ethnocentric, more and more religious at the same time, and they'll go up. And we know he Dawkins in that book goes on about all oh, the terrible things religious people have done, all the wars and massacres and whatever. Yeah, to different groups. To right. out groups, that's the point. With regard to in with regard to in groups or simply with regard to generalized morality when asked questions, religious people, it's just a fact, religious people are higher in agreeableness, in the trait of agreeable. They're higher in generalized altruism than atheists, and they're higher in generalized conscientiousness. They're more pro-social people on average. Let me take this in a in a 
interesting direction. So, I mean, there, there's a quote from, I, I'm forgetting, he's he's actually a Jewish scientist. It's, it's not Weiniger. It's, he has a name like that. But there's this classic quote that new atheists always uh, say, which is that, um, re- you know, whether religion can make a bad person good is up for dispute. Maybe that happens in some cases. Maybe it doesn't happen in others. But religion can make a good person bad. That is, religion can give you the power to go to war. Religion can make you conquer because God is on your side. Religion can make you persecute heretics, maybe within your community to maintain group cohesion. So religion can make good people bad, but uh, whether it can make bad people good is up for dispute. And I mean, I guess my answer to that is kind of like, yes. And the people who have God on their side are going to win. And, you know, at some point, you have to back away from this kind of moral peacocking and just recognize that those who believe in themselves and believe that their triumph is good for the world are going to triumph. It is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense of belief. Sorry, the sun is rising, perhaps symbolically right now. So my... The lighting in my room keeps changing, but don't worry about that. Um, Or maybe I'm about to be struck down by lightning. Uh, Who knows? Uh, But so it's those who believe that God is on their side are going to win. And I think in some ways, I mean, I gave Richard Dawkins a smidge of credit uh, for writing the God, for publishing the God delusion in 2006 in the sense that this was the height of the religious right and George W. Bush and the Iraq war. And I agree with him on being at the very least skeptical of those things and certainly opposing uh, the Iraq war. So, you know, good on you for that. Uh, But I think it it also kind of has a neoconservative element to it. And remember, perhaps the second most famous new atheist is Christopher Hitchens, a you know, contrarian left winger, uh, for right, writer for the nation, and a I think he was a Trotskyite at some point or something like this. Uh, but someone who ultimately became a kind of neoconservative, who who endorsed the Iraq War, wanted to crush Islamo fascism, uh, etc. He he was the contrarian of the left uh, of his day, and there's this almost neoconservative quality to new atheism in the sense that. Yes, they want to demoralize and demean the the religious right and the fundies and the vanjies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but their target seemingly is Islam at some level. I mean, particularly with someone like Sam Harris, uh, their target is Islam. You want to demoralize Islam. At the very least, you see this growing religious fervor on the horizon as a threat to your, you know, secular liberal society that you're wanting to uh, sure. defend. You seem like, quite skeptical of this. Well, well so, yeah, well, okay, you, you may be right about that, but was about the demoralizing Islam, but that's not really what they do, is it? These books are aimed at white middle class people. That, that, that these kind, if we're talking True. about Dawkins, this is not going to be read by Muslims. Muslims aren't going to read so it's a, So Dawkins is engaging in a completely anti-evolutionary process of demoralizing his own people so that they okay. will be conquered by Muslims. He demoralizes his own people so they will be conquered by Islam. So, so is Christopher Hitchens because they, he's taking away their religion and the thing right. that will allow them in the battle of group selection to try out, as they did do, as they did do at the time of the Crusades, The thing that allowed them to triumph over Islam was that we were at an earlier stage of civilization than the Muslims were at that stage. We were the Hmm. desert tribesmen. We were we were uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun's desert tribesmen with our high level of Asabiyah. And that is why, and that was also the case a bit later, and that is why we were able to successfully, one of the reasons why, we were able to successfully fight against Saladin and people like Hmm. this. Um, and and so and he is and people like Hitchens and Dinnett and uh, Dawkins and these other posers, these intellectual posers, De- Dennett and his impenetrable, impenetrable books about consciousness and whatever, are, um, are, 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 are just damaging their own side. So they're, mm. they're individualists who, who realize that they can attain status as individuals by doing this, by not by rocking the boat in a small little kind of kind of way, which doesn't damage them much themselves or creates a, a few enemies, but creates much more friends than it does enemies, signaling that how clever they are and how rational they are and damaging their group in the process. They're just there's parasites off the group. And the fact the fact that Islam will not tolerate this nonsense. 
within its own societies is one of the reasons why one of the reasons why of many um that, that it that it is growing mm -hmm. but the, the only the only interesting part of that new dawkins book is uh at the bit where he's trying to justify morality and he obviously you know he has no philosophical basis for any of his ethical claims but he, he keeps using this phrase where he talks about like some of the progress of the the past few hundred years like abolishing slavery and giving women the vote and he says there was just something in the air you know he uses this like quasi mystical language about like the progress of liberalism and you kind of see this with all of them i mean like atheism obviously is a a sort of value neutral worldview i mean it, it should be a you know, you should be a, a moral nihilist if you're an atheist, but they're all, they all have this complete reification of like Western liberalism and progressivism uh, that they can't really ground in anything, but that just so, it seems so obvious to all of them. It's the same in that book uh, Sam Harris wrote about moral foundations where, you know, he spends the whole book showing how like science can show us like levels of suffering and how to alleviate suffering. But again, he has no, you know, he has no philosophical basis for why, uh, progressivism and alleviating suffering is a good thing. So they're so, right. it's funny, at once they're attacking Christianity, but they're all so bound up in the Western tradition and uh, liberalism. And they're not the, self-critical or self-aware of it. Yeah, it, they it, don't see at all the like the historically contingent nature of some of the, the moral truths they believe and how reliant they were on the Christian tradition. Like, the, yes. in, in a weird way, they reify Christianity more than anyone. I was... Well, uh, I think that's a very interesting point that Keith makes there. This is a book I, I got some years ago called God is Dead by Steve Bruce. And it's mm. uh, basically it's the, the secularization thesis. Oh, well, they call it a thesis. It doesn't actually predict anything or allow any predictions to be made. But basically what it says is it basically, basically the idea is we get we get the we get well, it starts off with Weber. We get Protestantism. Protestantism makes us kind of more hardworking and makes us more rational somehow. I'm not sure that's true. That Protestant, I would say Protestantism is perhaps more religiously fervent. But anyway, from, um, from then we, we get the Industrial Revolution. From then we get science and science then just sort of magically spreads. People, right. people, people, people realize that science is, is the answer and science is the way forward. And we become more scientific in our thinking, more and more and more scientific. Our religiousness is rele relegated to private life and eventually religiousness dies out. And again, it's rather like there's something in the air. There's a there's there's a sort of miasma of science that, that floats, floats over, over the floats over society. And it, and it becomes more scientific. And when you show evidence that, well, look, yeah, it's becoming more scientific. Oh, look, and then this happens, and people become more religious. Oh, 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 wars, for example. Well, and mm -hmm. I would say well, it's because of stress. It's, it's reduction in stress that's causing this. There's, it's not science itself that sets off this process. There's, there's factors behind it, genetic factors and environmental factors that, that are reducible to biology. And, and, and he just says, oh, well, yeah, these are just humps and bumps. Well, you're always going to get humps and bumps in a general process. That doesn't explain anything at all. It just describes it. I think that's exactly what Keith was saying. This idea, it's just in the air. And anyway... Is it good that women have the vote? I mean, is that progress? I mean, well, let's think about what that's set off. But now, but, Ed, you know, come on. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's their own fundamentalism because obviously yes, they have no, they have no ethical foundation for why it's good that women vote. But if you if you challenge that, you know, they'll all be perfectly happy to to silence your Troyody Academy because you know there's something in the air. It's just as mystical a statement as. Uh, you know, I believe in I believe in the the God of the Old Testament because I feel it in my heart. You know, there's just something in the air. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Precisely. They just blithely accept postmodern liberal democratic norms, and I mean, what's kind what of like? Well, of course, science what, taught it. You know, it's science. What, what does women voting <laughs> yeah. mean? W women are less rational than men. Um, w women are, are lower in autistic traits than men. Women, are, the extreme male, is hyper 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 systematizing and to do with system and logic and solving problems and basically empirical truth and the extreme female is high in empathy and therefore disinterested in those things and more interested in everybody cooperating and everyone getting along and nobody having hurt feelings and not much competition and everyone just getting along so what does it result in if you have more and more women in just forget about voting in the academy it means less mm -hmm. science it means less science because suddenly something is more important than the truth and and reason and and logic uh, um, and the empirical fact. Something's more important than that, and that's getting on with people and everyone getting along and, and no one being upset and whatever. And so you get the rise of these midwits 
who are who are who are you know reasonably intelligent but more important than that is that they're good social skills and they're good at getting along with everybody and they conform and that's why women are highly conformist they're much more conformist than men it, uh, it's, that's documented they're much much more conformist they're higher in conscientiousness they're more higher religious in, than men yeah uh, traditionally yeah they're yeah. higher traditionally the, the the women would be more our uh, women are more religious than men because they're high when the uh, because they they are more moral more pro-social more altruistic they're selected to be more religious because if you're under a society where you have to invest in the female to get sex then the fact that she's religious is a is a insurance policy that you won't be cuckolded and so religiousness is sexually selected for in women in a way that it isn't in men so they're more religious um a, a, a more conformist and when the religion is, is a pro is a uh, an adaptive religion, then they are the enforcers of that, and they are they are the church ladies, and they are more conservative. And initially, giving the w women the vote meant that you had more conservative government because women were more religious. Yeah. Religious was was conservative, um, and women voted conservative. With the collapse of that religion and its replacement with liberalism, women are more conformist, uh, more pro-social, more group oriented, more more not wanting to hurt feelings, not wanting to vote, therefore more liberal. Um, and that's what we see now with the new church ladies of these woke harridans with their purple hair and, and bingo wings. Right. Uh, so is it good? To, and, and as Keith says, the fact that you can't question it, the fact, you know, is, it, is it necessarily good that they have the vote? Are these, these things, are these moral progresses, are they necessarily good always? Shouldn't a, <laughs> a scientist like Richard Dawkins and a philosopher, as he proposes to be, think about these questions, you know, cut carefully and without without rancor and without prejudgment. So no. <laughs> but the worst thing, I'm, I'm amazed Keith got far enough in the book to find this stuff. Because I try I tried to read the book. I tried to. Mm. And it was so bad. It was like teen fiction, as you say. It was it was just so bad mm -hmm. that I just couldn't I couldn't get I couldn't get past that. Yeah, I don't, like I don't think you can stress the point enough how bad their arguments are i mean they, they basically have three arguments that they repeat ad nauseum one is that evolution is true uh and they kind of build up a straw man of like fine-tuning arguments whereas you know normally fine-tuning arguments have have nothing to do with evolution anyway i mean most theists now in philosophy departments accept evolution the other one is that uh atheists can be moral which again uh no one really contests no theist really contests that it's not really a challenge to anything uh, and then the third one is that, well, look how evil the God of the Old Testament is. And that's, I mean, that's basically, that's their main argument is that they, uh, they hold up God as like just another contingent being like the tooth fairy or Santa Claus. And then they make like a, a logical positivist argument against that. But I mean, the problem is the whole tradition of theism doesn't argue for, a, you know, a contingent finite being. It argues for out of logical necessity, uh, some being that's the you know the necessary ground of contingent being, and comes to that true move, you know, move her. yeah, true you know logical modal inference. But then they, they'll never deal with that. And even Richard Dawkins famously avoided a debate with William Lane Craig for years, who is a you know a serious and respected theistic philosopher that engages in uh, Christian apologetics. He, he avoided that for years. Uh, Craig, like Craig, fairly easily dispatched. Uh, Hitchens and Harris. I think that's when it was kind of came to an end is when actual philosophers like Craig and David Bentley Hart started uh, writing books. Um, but yeah, Dawkins avoided a debate with Craig famously and wrote an article saying he'd never debate him because uh, Craig made ap apologies for uh, some some crime that God committed in the Old Testament. So Dawkins started accusing him of being a, an apologist for genocide, which was like... Oh, uh, I remember ver seeing that. Yeah, yeah, like a, a very transparent way of of getting out with someone who's actually competent in the field. But yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, again, it's worth pointing out. Like for all their popularity, it was I think a large part of their popularity was because it was it was such you know it was slop it was slop for the pros. There was nothing serious. I, there. I won't dwell on this, anything. but yeah, I mean, I I tweeted something out about this the, the other day. I don't know if you saw it, but I you know Craig is is putting forth a kind of Platonism. And I, I actually think that's what needs to be interrogated in the sense of like the, the as opposed to the low hanging fruit of the religious right or crazed Muslim fanatics. Uh, I, I think we actually need to examine that. Uh, and that's more interesting. I mean, I do think Craig is is I don't want to dwell on this, but I, I do think he's he's kind of fundamentally wrong or backwards, but he's he's wrong in a much deeper sense. He's wrong in the, in the way that the whole 
Platonist tradition is wrong. Yeah, uh, I mean, but people, people don't realize this, but like, it's funny. And I mean, everyone has this idea that, you know, uh, like the new atheists, everything is, is secularizing and we're moving past all this. But theism, actually a huge resurgence in philosophy uh, since like the mid 20th century, people like Alvin Plantinga and, and William Lane Craig uh, that have, you know, taken some of the, the work that was done on logic in the 20th century and have kind of revived like theistic personalism. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, uh, yeah, that is an, an interesting well, strand. That... Anthony Flew, who was very famous, and and he, he spent his career arguing for atheism, and in the end, he, he came to the conclusion. Yeah, I remember reading his book, and he was actually convinced by a, a fine-tuning argument of sorts, based on, you mm -hmm. know, the, the variables of, of uh, you know, contingent variables of the universe, and that they were so fine-tuned for life. But again, you know, Dawkins will, like, build up this straw man of like if evolution is true then you have to accept like a materialist atheistic worldview when there's like there's hardly a philosopher that believes that so a lot of the stuff was preying on his audience's ignorance i know i mean I, again i don't want to dwell on this too much but ju just from speaking merely from my perspective uh, i think we actually need to go back to the ancient world to look at the roots of this and particularly look at the just major shift that occurred post Plato and to understand ourselves because this is, I mean, Nietzsche's flippant one liner is Christianity is Plato for the people or Plato for the masses. Um, but what he, I mean, th that was a insult, but it, he, if you understand it deeper, uh, it is that whole line of thinking of logic and uh, be oh. beauty and truth existing in an outer realm. The, the famous and, quote by the famous quote by Alfred North Whitehead is that all of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. I agree. Yeah, let's and I mean, and, Plato. Let's go back to the pre-Socratics, and let's just go back to the fundamental idea that the. This should, well, this should I agree, be, Ed, but I'm not. But be, you know, look, this the, should be a question that societies, as they knew even then, as they documented, societies rise and fall. Um, they 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 go through these these seasons, and and it's when they lose their religiousness, they lose their fear of the gods, they become decadent, they rationalize everything, including having children. The intelligent stop having children, and the society collapses, and the and the cycle uh, carries on. And there's not and there's very little that can be done about it. But at the most, one one can say that we shouldn't encourage these people like Socrates to 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 corrupt exactly. the younger. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you're speaking my language. I mean, Socrates was, you know, he was killed for a reason. And it, it's like we, we like to put uh, Socrates was kind of the Dawkins of his day. He was a gadfly hanging around Athens, pissing off everyone, making them question everything. Yeah. And the BLM of his day. <laughs> and in corrupting the youth, and I have to say, the term corrupting the youth has some other associations, I wanna, and I, I don't mean, think... Which, which Plato did? I, I, I want to go on record as saying this. Socrates was an absolute <laughs> fuckwit. Um, <laughs> Dunn's like gone full. <laughs> I look. I I basically agree. I mean, the the only thing I would say we the problem is we don't know enough about many pre Platonics or pre pre Socratic philosophers, like Heraclitus. Um, and so and and and, and they them Heraclitus himself was a, a kind of kind of Nietzschean, kind of like poetic, kind of being playful, playing with words. Uh, but that the 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 one you know ep, you know. Uh, uh, passage of Heraclitus that almost everyone knows is that you never step into the same river twice. Uh, the river has changed, but then so have you. And I think what you can glimpse from these passages like that, which again are very poetic, you could hang it up on your wall, uh, but it's that tension of opposites within man it's himself and to understand something as both flowing and as static. It is still a river even though it is changing and moving. And you are still you, even though there are actually tensions and conflicts. And so it's, and, you know, even the, the word logos, which that, again that sounds, is now- that sounds I mean, more like Plato than Heraclitus, Richard. What? It sounds more like Plato. How? Oh, you know, you're because uh, you know you're finding like a a kind of a transcendent identity within the within which you're situating the change, you know. But the transcendent identity does not exist outside of this world. The transcendent identity is within the river itself. I mean, it, it really is fundamentally different. I mean, logos itself no, no, is. I mean, the, 
Well, you can have your own reading of Plato that's better. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll give you that. But I mean, I, I that is the fundamental move with Plato. But like logos itself, I mean, it means word, obviously. And there's this, you know, now, I mean, a couple of years ago, we had this like logos is rising meme of going back to the text or the dogma of the church or, or, or what have you. Uh, but I, Heraclitus, his conception of logos is different than that. Like the truth you are getting at is a darker, more dynamic truth. Uh, it is about tensions and opposites. Um, it, it is not just simply, you know, a, a, a reading the text. I, I think logos in a platonic sense is something that is, yeah, I mean, you are, I don't think it's just a metaphor. You are exiting the cave and seeing the world as it is. You are seeing the chair itself. You're seeing beauty itself. And uh, I think returning to pre-Socratic um, philosophy would be a, a something that we need to do kind of in the wake of the death of God. Because, I mean, I think we would all recognize, even the most devout theists would recognize that... It's so cliche that uh, one of the questions they might ask you, at a, like a philosophy interview for a university, is to like, mm -hmm. you do an essay on what makes a table a table. That's the essay. Right, exactly, yeah. Right. Well, there, there is this, respond, this joke... Respond. respond. That is a decadent question. <laughs> well, the best response ask that question. Yeah, um, the the best response is there was a philosophy seminar and the the professor put a table up on on uh, in front of them all and he said, you know, describe tableness to me uh, in uh, less than ten thousand words. You know, in in your blue book uh, in the next five hours. You know, have fun. And uh, the the smartest student we handed back the blue book early and it had one sentence. It said, "What table?" question mark yeah deep yeah, all right yeah. i find that funnier than you do fine no, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> but but i the only thing i would say is that we you you have to find something because even craig or, or other people would not deny that we are living in the death of god in the sense that the the christian system is self-critical it's had the wind knocked out of it at some level and we are living i mean i don't we're, we're living in a secular age to a degree now I, I i'm i am highly critical of that term but you understand where i'm going we are living at a point where it is more and more difficult to justify um actions on the basis of the church or a book or the christian tradition um, and also, these things have been have been suffering from withering or attacks need, that would not have been didn't tolerated need, previously. Didn't need to justify that was the thing. But, but when when there right. wasn't religious society until I don't know the fifties in in Europe or a bit later in America, you mm -hmm. didn't need to justify them on those grounds. It was just obvious. Of course, you right. can't. Of course, you can't steal. Of course, you can't lie. Of course, you can't kill people. Of course, you can't. Of course, it's bad. And and and, and when when society fragments like this into into these uh, group selected versus individually selected camps then th then there's absolutely no crossover there's absolute polarization which is when you get very very serious problems and, and which is what we're seeing uh now but I, I i'm not sure about the debt we're living through the death of god i think that if you look at the data on who has who has babies or who's breeding who's having mm -hmm. children then we could be, we could be living through the the event mm -hmm. the, the, the rebirth of god but uh but but you know I mean, yeah, the Even at the lead, I, I agree with you. I mean, this is um, something imagine that, you, you know. Imagine the future of just Nick Fuentes types. High, high uh, religious, high and extroversion. That's what we seem to be selecting for. Ah, uh, that's uh, horrifying. Get ready for thought. a world of Fuentes. <laughs> Get ready for a world war on thoughts, I guess. <laughs> um, WWT. Uh, is it, yeah, I mean, I... I agree with you to a large extent. I mean, we we did, we talked about this in in your book with like Eric Kaufman and the fact that the religious shall inherit the earth. Uh, you know, effectively, they are out. They are having what is it like one and a half children in in America? Um, evangelical Christians are having one and a half children for every one yeah. child of a wasp, and then. If you if you take it out further, it's kind of like a fundamentalist Muslim is having three children for every secular humanist western i mean it, it is pretty it is dramatic and and, uh, uh, and uh, a uh an amish is having seven children mm. um i don't think the amish will take over the world anytime soon but but i the, your point stands that it's it's like we might be at, at the end of a secular age and it was kind of a secular moment um at that being said i think the the 
intellectual crisis is still going to persist among the elite and culture makers. I, I don't think we can go back. I don't know. Maybe I'm well, wrong. Well, yeah, once, the, once you reach a tipping point of about 25% or something like that of the population being religious, then mm -hmm. um, and, they, and they'll be religious, remember, for genetic reasons. So you can be religious right. for environmental reasons, you can be religious for genetic reasons. The environmental reasons are out. Stress is so low that, that that's probably not a factor. People that are religious now or are right-wing now or are conservative are utterly resistant to the environment utterly resistant to an environment which is telling them to be maladaptive. They're totally resistant to it. And once those people become about 25% of the population, those are the people that are breeding, then you then you get a tipping point and then you get a change in the elite. And um, that's the kind of thing I, that one would... I'm, just, I'm writing a short thing on this at the moment. But that, that's the kind of thing that I would suspect is going to be happening within our lifetime, certainly. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I think the... You know, I think this current of... Um, relativism and materialism and humanism i think it's uh i think it'd be a mistake to see it as as uh, as something that has any kind of permanence i think it's i i think it's largely a reflection of uh sort of technical progress in in civilization and how that in influences people's thinking and i don't think it's uh i don't i mean there was no great revolution of thought that displaced theism or anton so i think this is Entirely. We think how quickly these things, these changes can happen, how, how fast they can happen, so, and often as well. It's when it's, it's when the the system feels itself under threat that it doubles down and becomes even right. more extreme. So the height of conservatism was probably the fifties, where you you were at a point where illegitimate children born to working class people were put up for adoption. That yeah. that didn't happen in Victorian times. That was happening in the fifties. Um, that was the the, the the height of it. Extreme persecution of homosexuality. They went from being tolerated in the thirties and forties to being persecuted heavily in the fifties in Britain and America. Uh, McCarthyism and whatever. It's when it's at its height that it tends. That that's when you know it's falling apart. I mean, I think about Ireland. Mm. The, the change has been so rapid that when when I went to Ireland in 2002 it was I it was Ireland it was the stereotypical Ireland we all know of mm -hmm. and when I went there in 2015 it wasn't um and uh, it had completely changed and that was in that, that was in just about 13 years yeah i mean it's easy to like up to 1992 uh, homosexuality was still illegal in Ireland so you want an example of how quickly things can change you know mm. yeah now you've got basically everybody that runs Ireland is gay yeah. <laughs> yeah, symposium as it were. San Francisco um, nation. <laughs>